Hello, teachers. I'm so excited to welcome you back to another series of episodes with my good friend, author Kenneth C. Davis. This time, we're going to be talking about In the Shadow of Liberty and specifically about slavery. And so these discussions we're going to be having are talking and teaching about the great American contradiction, slavery. And so I have with me, as I said, Kenneth C. Davis, who is the author of In the Shadow of Liberty, The Hidden History of Slavery, Four Presidents, and Five Black Lives. My name is Jessica Ellison, and I am a teacher educator at the Minnesota Historical Society. And here we are in episode one, the loudest yelps for liberty. And on the screen, you'll see some really compelling primary sources, and we are absolutely going to come back to these primary sources. But before we do that, we're going to have a little conversation with Ken, and we're going to talk a little bit about these sources and some other things. So, Ken, hello, welcome. Hello, Jessica. It is a pleasure to be with you again, and welcome to all the teachers who are out there as well. We are talking about something that is, to me, to my mind, as important as anything we can talk about in American history. Uh, I've been writing and talking about American history for 30 years. It's hard for me to even say that, but it's true. Don't Know Much About History came out 30 years ago. And for those who don't know it, it's a book of questions and answers. It asks some very basic questions sometimes like, did Columbus really discover America and what does the Declaration of Independence declare? But it also qu asks questions like, how do these men who write those words, all men are created equal and are entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, how do those men who sacrifice everything go home to plantations utterly dependent upon enslaved labor. And yes, to me, that has been the great contradiction in our history, that a nation conceived in liberty was also born in chains. I've tried to answer that question in many ways over the years, and it came to me a few years ago that the best way to perhaps discuss it, especially for younger people, was to put it a human face on it and discuss the role of slavery in American history through the lives of five people who were enslaved by four of our most famous and greatest presidents, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, and Jackson. And that's what uh, In the Shadow of Liberty is about, these human stories of real people. But it also explores the much bigger question of the role slavery plays in the building, the foundation, and the history of the United States, uh, a history that of course led to the Civil War and has led to all the racial strife that the country has lived through for 400 years now. So it is central to who we are as a nation. It's central to the problems we still face uh, in racial issues. And that's why I think it's so important to have this conversation. Absolutely. And it's something that students will be intrinsically interested in. And there's a lot of fantastic primary sources to help this discussion. So you mentioned four presidents and Washington and Jefferson are really the greatest examples of the contradiction between American ideals and slavery. So let's talk about Washington. How did he see slavery? George Washington was born into plantation slavery. He became, uh, his, obviously his parents were slave and slavers. Uh, he was born into a household in which slaves did everything for him as a child. Uh, but his father died when George Washington was 11. And at that time, he inherited the first of his human property. Uh, so he grew up in the world of racial slavery, of African slavery. It was the, the natural order for him. Uh, certainly as he grew into adulthood, uh, slavery represented the key to his financial uh, success, his financial wealth, his personal power, his personal wealth. It was everything to a Virginia planter uh, and he couldn't have lived without it by the standards of the day. As time went by, Washington eventually changed his views about slavery. Certainly, as a younger man, he bought and sold people without too much regard for the contradiction 
Um, but certainly as he gets into the revolutionary era, the contradiction becomes more apparent to him. And even during the revolution, he writes to a, a very good friend that nothing is more certain that these people shall someday be free and no one wants a plan for abolition more than I. That's Washington's own words, but he does precious little to actually bring it about. He was like other slaveholders then completely dependent upon slavery and the work of the enslaved to put food on his table, to put clothes on his back, uh, to fill his bank accounts, to make the products that he could sell to make money. And he was a wealthy man, wealthy on paper more than in actual, um, uh, actual cash holdings. Uh, like a lot of planters, he was always in debt because his real value was tied up in the enormous amount of, of human property he held. So he was conflicted about slavery. He knew it was in opposition and contradiction to what he stood for and certainly went to war for and spent eight years of his life from 1775 to 1783 battling for the freedom, the liberty of the United States of America, but knowing that he was still dependent upon it financially. He was presented with a plan at one point by the Marquis de Lafayette, the young Frenchman he considered practically his own son. Um, he did not have his own children. Uh, but uh, even when the Marquis de Lafayette said, I will give you a plan to free all of your people, I will give them an island and you can teach them to farm for themselves and educate them, Washington pushes back from that. He believed, like a lot of the founding fathers, that democracy and the American Republican system would eventually make slavery obsolete. They believed that the ideas of liberty, of freedom, of enterprise would eventually doom slavery in the United States. In that, they were tragically, optimistically, and fatally wrong. Jefferson had the same ideas. So Washington is this uh, perfect exemplar of the, this great contradiction. Um, certainly when the time comes that he enters politics, and of course he sits at the constitutional convention that decides the future of slavery in America in, in many ways and sets slavery in stone as part of the constitution, he understands that slavery is going to convey enormous political power to the slaveholding states. And that's such an important point that we must come back to. And so I'll be happy to talk a little bit more about that. But it's still the human factor that I come back to, that when Washington is a fairly, still a young man, he goes and purchases four young boys at an estate sale. We would go to an estate sale and we might buy some old books or somebody's dishes or old rugs or uh, furniture. Washington bought four young boys. Two of them were dark-skinned and were destined to the field. Two of them were light-skinned and they were going to work in the house. One of those boys was William Lee and he would spend every day of his life from the time he was about 14 for the next 30 years or more with George Washington. And you cannot then take away that human aspect what did Washington's relationship with William Lee, his trusted manservant, have to do with his own attitudes about slavery? It's something I talk about in, in The Shadow of Liberty. So what do we know about William Lee other than when Washington purchased him? Well, that's the first place he appears officially is, is in Washington's uh, diary. He kept a very close track of all of his expenditures. He doesn't write too much personal uh, information. Washington was very tight-lipped about his own feelings. About he was not pouring himself out into his diary, but he noted very carefully how much he spent for each of these four boys and where they were going to be going. Um, but that is the beginning of the official documentation of William Lee as the property of George Washington. And most of William Lee's life is documented in other people's writings. William Lee, we don't know if he could write or read. There's no evidence that he could or couldn't. 
He was entrusted with Washington's most personal documents during the war. Washington says so himself. We have presumed that those include Washington's letters to Martha Washington, which she later burned, by the way. Uh, so this was a, a, a man who appears throughout history, but always in the shadows. And that's one of the reasons I wrote a book called In the Shadow of Liberty, because these African-Americans who were so closely linked, so intimately related to the lives of these people were very often completely in the shadows. But William Lee is depicted several times in very notable paintings, and it's one of the images that we have there, uh, in the background. He's always standing behind Washington, often holding a horse, uh, often with an orange turban on his head, a kind of artist's um, uh, technique for showing how Africans were very exotic, I suppose. Um, but there's no documentation in his own hand about William Lee. Everything we know about him is written in letters, but there are many references to him in Washington's letters because he was so often beside Washington. We know he was with Washington in Philadelphia when Washington goes off to take command of the army. First account of Washington arriving in Cambridge, Massachusetts includes a reference to William Lee and Washington racing in to break up a fight between two groups of soldiers, some from Massachusetts and some for, from Virginia. So it was very, very vivid that he's there. He carries Washington's telescope, uh, his field glass through the war. As I mentioned, he carries documents for Washington. So a completely trusted person uh, in, in Washington's life. We have references to people writing to Washington about William Lee's family back in, uh, in Mount Vernon while, while William Lee is with Washington. But we don't really know anything about that family. We know that William Lee is in Valley Forge with Washington in that bitter winter, but we don't know, actually know where he slept. Uh, we know where Washington slept. Presumably Lee slept on the floor nearby or perhaps in a stable. Uh, so there, there are many details missing that we wish we had, but there are also enormous references to William Lee and this particular relationship. It's an extraordinary account of Washington uh, and Lee going out into the woods on uh, a winter time and Lee falling down and uh, hurting his knee and Washington actually drags him back on a sled. What a picture that is of George Washington dragging an enslaved man back to Mount Vernon on a sled because he's hurt. Uh, once again, it's very complicated relationship between enslaved and enslaver. Well, and it's fascinating that we know so much about William Lee because of his proximity to this famous person, this person who held an important role, and also tragic that there's so many people we don't know about because they weren't in close proximity to someone whose records we hold on to. So it's, an in, it's a really interesting story that brings in the humanity of, of slavery. Absolutely, and that's one of the most important reasons I wanted to focus on these five people because, because of their proximity to these great men, we do know much more about them. Uh, in some of the other cases, and we'll talk about them as we go forward, uh, they actually did tell their own stories. Even if they didn't write them their, themselves, they were recorded. So we have these recollections. But back to the documentation of William Lee for one moment, because it's a very important one. The, perhaps the most important piece of documentation about William Lee is the reference to him in George Washington's will. William Lee is the only enslaved person who is emancipated by name in Washington's last will and testament. Other enslaved people that were, uh, were Washington's property were to be remain enslaved until after Martha Washington's death. Then there were even others that Washington controlled that weren't his own personal pro uh, property. These were known as dower slaves. They actually belonged to the estate of Martha Washington's first husband, the Custis estate. And those people were going to be returned to the Custis. So a lot of people have this impression, and it's just reduced simply to this, oh, George Washington emancipated slaves in his, uh, in his will. That's not accurate. 
and the real story is much more uh, complicated. But William Lee is a way to talk about that much more complicated story because William Lee is freed. But interestingly, after Washington's death, even though he is freed, he remains at Mount Vernon. Uh, where else would he go? Uh, this is a man uh, uh, now with broken down knees, uh, perhaps even a drinker uh, late in his life. It's uh, a little unclear. Uh, who's probably the most famous African-American man of the time. Everyone knew that William Lee had gone to war with George Washington. People came to Mount Vernon afterwards and they would listen to William Lee tell stories of the great George Washington and they would give him a few coins. That's probably the way he managed in the last few years of his life. But just to underscore that the enslaved person and the African-American person was really a person of no account in a way in that world. We don't know te technically when William Lee died or where he is buried. Pres he is presumed to be married in the African-American graveyard, uh, which is uh, unmarked graves near Washington's own tomb at Mount Vernon, but no one has any certainty uh, whether or where William Lee's body was interred, or when he even actually died. There's some discrepancy in those dates. Well, that again underscores this idea that these were people who were in the shadow of this tremendous greatness, but completely in darkness. It really just makes me wish that I could go back and save all of those primary documents that you know, were destroyed or, or um, managed to slip away because I think this story is so fascinating. Uh, so let's take a look at some primary sources then related to this. Now there are of course so many primary sources about George Washington, um, but these two in particular I think are really fascinating with this story. The teeth, the teeth are very famous. These are George Washington's teeth. Uh, and the important thing to remember about these as you're having students take a look at this, this object is that George Washington's dentures included teeth from enslaved people. So as we look at this complicated man, this is something we can't look past. So this is a great historical artifact to dive into with your students and, and really take a closer look. But I also really like this engraving. Um, as Ken was talking about earlier, this one of, of Washington and William Lee. And what I would recommend with something like this is something called a magic square activity, where you can take this source and cut it into pieces sort of like this, where it divides it and give each of these pieces to different students in the classroom and have them analyze the pieces separately and then put the pieces back together so that each student is an expert on their section. But then when they put it together, what kind of story does this tell about George Washington and about William Lee? So this is a great activity. A lot of teachers I know use this. Um, there's a lot of variations, but a really nice way to dive into this primary source. So thank you so much for joining us today. I wanted to make sure that I shared with you then the resources that go along with this. This bit.ly will get you to a resource document with these primary sources linked and other sources. It's bit.ly slash capital S shadow, capital L liberty. And if you have any questions, please do feel free to send me an email at jessica.ellison at mnhs.org. So thank you very much and we'll see you in episode two.